I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. It's great to see all the faces that I do know and all the beautiful faces that I don't know. So uh, what we're going to have a discussion talk about tonight, the social responsibility of the artist is something that I'm uh, very passionate about. And uh, we'll deal with it as, it as it pertains to my own artistic journey and um, a few other artists that have inspired me along the way. So before I even go into this guy that's on the, on the screen here with Wild Coyote, I'll say that um, I, I really started my, my art journey primarily as a, as a figure drawer. I was figure drawing ever since I was probably about 15 years old at, um, if anybody knows Sandy and Talia Lerman in the community, Talia works here. Um, I, I started drawing at their place at a very young age. And so I kind of came up as a classical figure drawer. I used to draw Brooke, actually, who's in, the, in there too as well, who's a model. Uh, I'll put you on the spot. And, um, and so for me, that was, um, it was a really powerful experience. And a lot of it was about the process and, and really getting lost in the process. And as I moved further on in my journey, I, my first stop was uh, Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design. And when I got there, um, they had a, a magnificent drawing program that was connected with, um, with Marquette. That program had two different dimensions to it. One which was very um, traditional and heavenly, um, like academic on figure drawing, and was connected with the medical school. So we got to dissect bodies with the medical students that were there. And it was a very powerful experience. But then there was also this, this other side that was very open. Okay. And what I started to realize, like, when as my, my figure drawings were getting really, really good over the years, was that I, I got to this point where I just felt like I was just making really good drawings. And that was it. And um, even though there felt like there, there was this other thing there, I was having very profound experiences of, of losing myself in the process. It felt like when I was just done that I was just making good drawings. And, and through that opened up this other world of um, discovering something more outside of just making good drawings. There were several people that influenced me at that time, but um, one of the, the first ones that really kind of just like blew my mind open was uh, Joseph Boys, who you see on the screen right now. Joseph Boys refused to come and do any shows. He's a German artist, and he refused to do any shows in the United States until the Vietnam War ended. Um, so he had a very powerful stand that he would not do a show here until that occurred. And um, I just found him very peculiar. Uh, the top piece that you see up here is, uh, I like America, and America likes me. And what he was really... He, he would play a lot of really weird roles, and one of them was as a, as a shaman. And so what he did was he, when he came to New York to do, do a show, he, he locked himself in the gallery and caged himself in with a wild coyote. And um, he trapped himself in there for days. And at the beginning of it, you know, you can see that the coyote wasn't very happy. <laughs> about them being in the same space with each other. And um, by the end, you know, they were buddies. And um, his, his thought behind it, which really intrigued me, was that he saw the coyote as a symbol of America before European settlers. So in I Like America, America Likes Me, he was referring to liking an American, a, a, a Native America. And so it was just, it was really profound and it, it just blew my whole world open. And if anybody knows anything else about Joseph Boy, he, he, he created a whole myth around himself that um, was, the myth was that he was a World War II pilot and he crashed and he was saved by a group of tribesmen, a group of Tartars that wrapped him in fat and felt and how that was crucial to his survival. So all of his work at that time started to 
revolve around these materials, fat and felt, and it was just very peculiar and nothing like I had ever really experienced as far as art. But as I studied it more and more towards the end, it was really profound what um, some of the things that I saw that he was doing. Um, towards the end of his career, he really became less about art objects and art as commodities, and, and he created things called social sculptures. And so social sculpture um, was essentially like shaping the, you know, the minds of people by having interactions and experiences and, and um, discussions and all sorts of things. And, and one of his final um, projects that he did was they planted 7,000 oak trees, each marked with a, a basalt stone. And all of these projects that he did began to engage the community and engage people from the public. And my understanding of art at this time was, was very small, you know? So this, this really was the beginning of something for me that intrigued me that, that there was an artist that, where it wasn't about just, you know, I, I realized when I was making nice drawings and how great drawing, how, how good of a drawing I can make that it was really my ego was getting involved. And so my work started to, you know, take a, take a journey outside of that. In the beginning, I mean, there's, there's some work um, in between this, but this is where I'd like to start with my work. This was like when I really started getting into creating art experiences and creating things outside of just creating objects. And one of the first projects that I did was this piece called Coil Conduit. And this was a gallery that I went into, and they agreed to let me and a, and a crew of people, so it, it was definitely a community project, wrap the entire conduit system, the electrical system, in the gallery with red yarn. So we went in there and we wrapped it all with red yarn and we painted the floor white. There's a detail of it. Um, and you can start to see like that there's this fuzz that gets created around it. So when you walked in and you saw the conduit, there was like this fuzzy, energy kind of going around all of the electrical conduit. But I've always been um, really fascinated by the things and spaces that, that go unseen or underlooked or, um, or taken for granted. And so for me, like electrical systems were one of those things like within a gallery setting. So, you know, it was, it was really the experience that people were having we're walking in here, and then the, the piece of conduit that came down lit the name tag on the wall, and, and then just sent them on a journey to, to see. At the same time that that was happening, their footprints and all of that stuff was ripping up the white on the floor, and hopefully making them aware of their own presence within the gallery space. Seeing themselves as part of the work and, and the work itself, because Without those things, I mean, really, you know, it, it doesn't exist. So this was, this was kind of the beginning of me traveling into that territory um, that, was, that was new for me. After that, I started really toying with, um, with performance work. It was exciting to me. And, and so I did a series of these projects when I was in graduate school where I would go to galleries, I would have a friend or some kind of plant in the gallery um, make a mess, you know, like drop their bottle or like their food on the floor or something like that. And they would make a mess. And then I would, they would tell me or text me like when they made the mess and I would come in as a janitor. And, and um, when I would come in as a janitor, it was a process of ritualistically cleaning up the mess, um, cleaning it in a celebratory way so the sweeping was rhythmic. The, the drawing on the ground, you know, was very like sweeping and, and dance-like. The whole process had a rhythm, a sound, a dance to it. And then after I made something, I'd sweep it up, I'd clean it, I'd, you know, and I'd get out of there. So, you know, to bring it, to tie it back into, you know, where I started to feel a sense of, uh, social responsibility, I felt like that there was, you know, this is just another example of, of something that was undervalued to me or um, some, you know, someone that perhaps doesn't get acknowledged, but also, I, I, you know, I was really inspired 
when I'd work in my studio at night, I'd communicate with a lot of the custodians that would come in. And um, some of the guys that I would communicate with were like some of the happiest people that I ever met in my life, you know? And, um, and I just found that that was really profound. It was really the first, um, I, I mean, not, not, maybe not the first, but it, it really got me on the path of that it's really our perception of, of what we're doing that has, uh, of has us be happy or not, you know, that it's a, that it's a choice. And so for me, um, it was really exciting to bring that into an arena of art to basically say like, you know, you can be like making art when you're washing your dishes, you know, or be in that kind of space. So I did a bunch of these projects all around campus in different settings. Um, in and outside of the gallery. And that's another thing that really became important to me was to explore my work within um, the gallery setting and outside of the gallery setting. So um, one of the next projects that I did, uh, I started having an itch to, to draw again. And uh, I created these projects where I'd go in and draw directly on the gallery walls. and. Um, at this point, I was really like moving away from any kind of object. You know, I felt a lot like that. You know, I, I think I had resistance at that time towards creating work that was a commodity, which I don't necessarily have that as much anymore, but that was a question that, that, that was important to me at the time. And so I, I'd go into these spaces and I'd draw directly on the walls and um, towards the end of the uh, the opening or at the closing, I would wash the drawings off the wall and they would leave this kind of like foggy, energetic field. And, and um, you know, one of the things that, that points in my artist statement to this, to this kind of work is, is um, a lot of my work is about really the fleeting nature of life and really being an appreciation why we have what we have. And, um, this particular work, these, these were images that were taken from a friend of mine's homegoing ceremony. Um, and so uh, the actual subjects being related to someone's experience of death um, uh, was, was powerful for me. And, and also to be able to you know, make a drawing and not be attached to it and wash it off the wall and have people witness that process was um, was new territory for me and exciting ground. And, and hopefully was pointing at something that would maybe shift the way that people, you know, saw. Before I did any of this stuff, I, uh, I was at a residency in France and then I went, to, I went to New York. And as soon as I got to New York, the trade centers collapsed a couple of days later. And so there was this constant process of really being reminded of, of how, you know, life is incredibly fragile. Before I even did that, when I went to France, uh, I, almost the entire side of my mom's family, including my mother, uh, passed away. And so that was like something that was making its way into my work and, and really not being pissed off about death, but really just embracing it as a process in, uh, to life. So when I got to New York, they threw a bunch of art students in this warehouse. You know, you had no instructors, you just had like art, uh, studio artists come in, you had art critics come in, and, and what I found was that a lot of artists that were in there, they didn't have a printmaking studio, they didn't have a photography studio, they didn't have like the sculpture facilities, it was just artists and studios, like that's what it was. And I found that a lot of artists couldn't, didn't transition. They didn't know what the hell to do. Um, and and that, that really was an important moment for me. And um, so at, at the time, I, I recognized um, this quote from Boys that kind of set me on this journey. And it says, if a person is an artist, he can use the most primitive of instruments. A broken knife is enough. Otherwise, it remains a craft school. So it was like the first time that I got like clear that Art for me wasn't just like a medium. It wasn't just like a painting practice. It wasn't just, even though I painted, and I love painting, even though I draw, I love drawing, that, that there was something more 
that you could certainly do that and create art, but that there was something more than that. And so this was just like me continuing on this journey of, of discovering what that was. So these were also drawings that I erased off the wall. When I erased this one off, you know, the white light was left behind. Um, so you just kind of like sense this uh, energy field, if you will. So after I um, was doing those works, I was toying around with some new processes. And uh, I saw this, this artist who I thought made this incredible work. And the project, it was this uh, contemporary Thai artist. And he made this work called Problem Wisdom. And what he did was he took newspapers from every day and he would look at whatever problem, social problem, which was going on in the world. He would grind the paper up into a pulp. He would write down what that problem was. And then he would make a little stupa, a little statue. And he would do that every day. And then the following year after that, he would meditate on that problem with like a solution. And so it was a two-year project, one in which where he made this little stupa and one where he, he meditated. And so um, I don't remember what it was exactly that, that caught my attention, but I was reading the news, and there was something in there that, that really struck me. And you know, at this point, I guess I should really uh, mention that a big part of my influence as a young child was, was hip-hop and especially as it pertains to social responsibility. Um, I grew up as a young child when hip hop was emerging in, in Philadelphia. And um, my experiences in the community of, of break dancing, uh, of the music, of the graffiti art, had a big impact on my life. And I never really connected it to my artistic process. But there was several poets or MCs that, that really stuck out to me in terms of having messages to um, you know, raise the social consciousness. Primarily uh, Boogie Down Productions or KRS-One, if you know, he was like doing projects. He was doing stuff of, it, it, was, like, it was like having parenting growing up, you know, from, uh, from another source. It was really, it, it, was, it was education for sure through, through entertainment. And he, he, he did a lot of work on everything from like behind the scenes and slaughterhouses to p police brutality, like he, you name it, like any kind of social issue, he was making songs about it. So anyway, with this project, um, I reframed this newspaper, these collages into these images that, that reminded me of, of my childhood. And then I would write new stories within the newspaper. So I would cut out all of the words and then I would reframe them to say different things. So. You know, this one in here, I think, says shine. And, but some of them had more, like, paragraphs that you could actually read. But something still wasn't right. You know, like, when I saw these images, like, on the walls and in the galleries and something, it still felt, something felt off. They felt like they didn't quite belong where they were at. Um, this is a detail. You can see that they're just pinned up there and that it's just all cut and paste newspaper. So I moved them outside. And when I moved them outside, um, something started to happen that was, that was new for me, you know? Um, I'd, take, I, I'd take walks, you know, if anybody knows, like Richard Long, like a lot of his work is like made from like taking long walks. And so I'd have these walks and, and find spaces that really I was drawn to, um, I, which were mainly like old dilapidated buildings and, and um, old warehouses, abandoned spaces, you name it. Like, I was very um, attracted to that on, on a lot of different levels for a lot of different reasons. And um, in some of these spaces, I started to collect stuff from. You know, I, I'd go into old abandoned homes that were, you know, just left, and, and I'd take some of the material, excavate some of the material, and I started playing with these images related to these kind of spaces. And then it, it, um, it spawned this project, which was a really important landmark for me in, in my journey as an artist. So I came across this abandoned space that had, you know, all sorts of brick and rubble and pallets that were just thrown everywhere. 
and garbage, and there was all this stuff. And I don't even know initially what um, compelled me to start playing with it, but it was just like, it was almost like an intuitive, like a kid, that I just like went over and started rearranging the bricks and you stacking the pallets and, and all this kind of stuff. And when I stacked these pallets, I, I saw this stoop, you know, the city stoop that reminded me of, of of my times as a child in Philadelphia. And so it, it really brought me back to that. And so I stacked all of the bricks and, and arranged the, the pallets as a stoop. And when all this rubble was left over, um, uh, I began to, you know, make a rock garden out of it. And so what I would do was I'd post up at this space every day um, for whatever the duration was, and I would uh, sit on the stoop and I would do everything from recite poetry to make uh, drawings in, in the rubble with the beer bottles that were left in there or with, there was like a little um, broom that was left in the pile and, um, and you know some rakes and some other things and I would make drawings in there and uh, you know people would probably think I was crazy and and all of that which you know maybe maybe I am but to me there's always uh, been like a sacred quality to these spaces that I've I personally felt went unseen so for me it was about how can I make it seen how could I make somebody stop that was walking by an abandoned space and, and see that, that quality, um, the magic that I saw in it. And so um, really moving out into public space became important to me and reaching people with my art beyond you know, gallery walls um, became incredibly important to me. And, and it did with the janitor piece that you saw earlier as well, you know, like I do that like in galleries, but I'd also do it in various different buildings as, as interruptions into, into just normal, normal life. So um, when I did that, I started collapsing a lot of these projects together into these collages, and it was the first time that I really, you know, started getting back into collage work, and, and um, I felt like these started to express something a little bit more that I hadn't, I was, I was kind of pissed at myself that I didn't get a lot of documentation and video work of the things that I was doing in this space. And so when I started doing these collages, it was, this was like a way for me to kind of collapse what was happening because the way that I would interact with the rubble garden or the activity that was happening in these images were, were things that I could conjure, but I'm sure that other people you know, weren't able to. So this was a way for me to, to bring that into being. And, um, and this, uh, this spawned some, some new gallery work. So um, in this, what you see here, this is all individual sculptures, but these also became a, a stage for a performance. So this was another stoop that was made out of pallets and it's, it's lined with wood in between that has various different grades. So on the bottom was like pine, and this was cedar, and this was cherry or walnut up top. Um, so there was just a sense of elevating with, the, with each step. In the back here um, was a pyramid that was made out of bricks. Um, my work is often born, born from people that I communicate with in the community just, just as like my, the piece that I did with the janitor. So when I did this work, there was a guy that I met who would, um, he had an old car. He had this really old car, but he would always wax it. And he would wax it so much that the paint wore away and it had all these spots on it. And um, there was something really magical and powerful to me about that, that, like, that he loved it so much and it was like this old, old thing. So when I made these sets of steps, I also, um, in the piece, this piece is, is called The Next Level, Social Stoop. Um, I did a video of, of waxing, you know, waxing the steps and polishing the steps and, and taking care of the steps and, and honoring the steps. And, and, um, and, and I would elevate with each one, you know, and um, so that was, that was this. Now simultaneously, this was the stage for a performance. 
that you'll see coming up, which was called Graffiti Cat. And it was a, um, the, all of these things that you see in the background are, are different representations of uh, magnum graffiti markers, which are like commonly used by graffiti writers to just like tag their name up everywhere. Like if you ever see a graffiti writer, there's like names everywhere. It's like these markers that you're using. So I represented those markers in various different ways throughout the gallery. Um, one was embedded as a fossil on top on the top of, of this brick pyramid. These were represented, um, and you'll see them more clearly in other images, as like really massive bullets. So that's the that's the embedded fossil of the of the brick piece. Um, and these were all like iron and steel. These were all like you know casted pieces. And these were representative of, of male genitalia. And um, when I, so this was the inside of the space, uh, or that's the outside of the space. This is the inside of the space where I did this performance. And um, so in the first part of the performance, you know, like um, my performance was very like cat gestury and, and sounds. So when I came and entered into this space, you know, and um, I, I call these like marker dicks, whatever you want to call them, like, there was all these relationships that was really fascinating to me that I was playing with in terms of graffiti art being this territorial thing between um, art being um, a weapon between, um, you know, how all of these things play into masculinity um, between animals and, and, and their territorial behaviors. So when I came into this space, you know, I had my real loud male territorial cat cry, you know, as I came here to like post, post up images and, and write on walls and, and do all these sorts of things. So I had various different things that I did. I drew on walls. I, um, here I'm taking out my staple gun and I'm posting up images. So there was a lot of sound involved to, to really like land the the bullets and stuff like that so there was like clack 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 from staple guns and all that kind of stuff and and i was posting these images and drawings of cats that i had made um and so then i used one of the markers to pee on a wall and 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 then you know draw on stuff and then um in the top right over here um actually like after i peed on the wall of course i was scratching like a cat on, on the wall, and I, I had sandpaper on my hand, so I was like sanding the white gallery dust off the wall. And then um, I put it through another marker, which was, if you've ever seen um, Tibetan sand paintings, you know how they put the dust through that. I put it through the marker, and um, I was putting it in this, um, at the bottom base of this sign, the one day sign was um, an adinkra, adinkra symbol, which is a West African symbol for hope. And so, you know, that was like the final, that was the final step of that process, which really like launched me into my next project. The next project, how many of you have seen this, this piece in public space? Yeah. Um, so this was the Electric Casket Gallery, which I still, um, do variations of this project to this day. It's an evolving piece that I continue to work with, and anything that I do really becomes like continuing projects. Because I'm not interested in really like wasting. I'm not really interested in my art being like uh, left like some byproduct that has to sit in a sto storage unit. Ironically enough, um, that I'm not interested in that. So um, this piece during the first first stage of it. On the outside is, more, is representative of, of art outside of the gallery space. Um, so you have on the outside here like graffiti writers writing things, images, things being stenciled on it. And this piece was actually born, born of a, a poem that I created. So for the first part of the performance, I, I made a plaster suit and which was really beautiful at, because at the same time that I did this piece, the Norton Museum was showing George Seagal's figures, okay? And so this was like something that I was playing with that was like happening at the same time and having a relationship between that. If anybody knows George Seagal, he's, he's the guy that does all of the white plastered figures and you know, it, you see him at bus stops and all kinds of stuff, but they're just generic figures that, that are 
just these white statues. Um, so you can imagine that my movement was very limited early on in this process, and I was essentially a, a res restricted statue. Um, you know, as I was like, you know, viewing the work that was in the gallery and stuff like that, things began to chip and crack, and, and which was which was awesome because uh, people would step on it and it would track throughout the entire exhibition. So you could see like the white dust carry, you know, everywhere. So these, uh, this I included in because you know people were having a kick out of it. You know, it was uh, really moving into work that other people could have an experience with and interact with um, became in, in, incredibly fulfilling to me um, that people had to think about uh, was, re was really powerful. So the, the second part of this project was uh, it went from being you know, a vertical gallery, claustrophobic gallery to a casket. And, um, this, this marked another point in my work where um, things really, really shifted for me. I, I, I wasn't able to be at this exhibition. And so um, it became an opportunity for me to delegate my performances out. And it was like meeting back up with that thing that I confronted early on with my, with my artwork, which was that you know, making really good drawings became about, you know, my ego, like how good I, how good I was at something. Um, and giving up that, giving up, like being in my own performance was a really big step for me. And it also was, um, I, I, it was a really powerful thing. So what happened was people, um, thank you, by the way, Alan. Alan was one of my supports there. Um, so what people did was there was stacks of white paper and what they were asked to do was, or what they were invited to do was to take something that they wasn't serving them in their lives and to write it down and to put it into the casket. So all of the viewers were coming up writing something that like wasn't serving them in their life. Sometimes it was multiple things and they would throw it into this casket. And at the same time, you can kind of see that there's a light back there, um, there was a light that was emerging from the casket, there was a projection, and that projection was, um, you know, had a reel of different possibilities for living, um, of new possibilities for living. So you can see that on top of the suit was all of these things that people were writing. Here's just a couple details of what was going on on the outside of the box, some things that I thought were pretty powerful synchronicities for me when I, when I was or originally making the box and I, and I bought the wood for it, it said strip, it says strip on it. So I sanded off the S and the T and, um, you know, so that was there. And, you know, these were um, some of the writings and, and there was a marker bullet, and, you know, some of these other things. So this was the outside of the box and things that people were writing and, and posting. Um, on the box. And um, after you saw that everybody threw everything in the box, uh, I began to stuff the box. Um, this was actually from another show that I did in Miami during Basel, which was another. Um, I got to do this outside of a gallery space, but connected to the gallery. And so I stuffed the suit, and the suit grew big and fat. And that was exciting to me because it came back, back alive. And when I finished this, I realized that there were some things that I wanted to add to the suit, the things that were like no longer serving me in my, in my life. Um, and so in the, in the final one, I added um, white flour, white rice, and white sugar into the suit. Because those were things that I wanted to purge out of my own diet and out of my life that weren't serving me in my health. This was the last, last time I did this project. The casket this time was, um, was set on a bed of wheatgrass. So the, my juicer was plugged into the side of it over here. And um, the viewers could come and they could clip off the wheatgrass and they could have shots of wheatgrass. 
And um, so some things happened at the time, like you could see kind of the flour and the sugar and stuff outside the suit. It, it rained while we were out there. And, and you know, like the way that I operate, you know, you know, you always like have your, your art teachers that are like, oh, that's not a mess up, that's, you know, an opportunity. And so um, it, it, was, it was awesome because the white flour got really doughy. And all of the things that people had wrote on the paper started to bleed and dissolve, which was really cool. And so um, part of my performance was I was taking those things out and sticking them on the wall in the gallery. And you can see that I had some of my collages and stuff in the gallery as well. But um, this piece really, um, you want to hear about this piece, right? What, uh, like what I was doing? So there was, um, for me, I was always emerged in two different worlds of, of creating work outside the gallery and inside the gallery, really being pulled by the creativity of, of, of street art and, and hip hop and, and being a, an institutionalized artist. You know, I was really in between those two worlds. And so, you know, there was the inside of the gallery, the outside of the gallery. There was the relationship of, you know, wheatgrass and, and health and, and the sterile quality of the institution, you know, the white walls, processed foods. There was those two worlds that I was playing with um, there. There was the, you know, the, I talked earlier about how interested I am by, like, infrastructure, the things that go unseen, um, the inside, like, all the workings, the, the electrical pipe, the two by fours. Um, the backs of the drywall. And then there was also a metaphor for race that was happening there for me in terms of um, what I experienced inside the institution, which was that there was a, 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 certain, a privilege, you know, that existed. And, um, and having those two worlds next to each other coexisting um, was a powerful for relationship for me to examine myself and, and for other people to examine. So actually, I'm going to read the poem that it's born from because I think it's only right and it explains it, you know, it explains a lot of what's happening. So I wrote this poem and then I, um, and then I made this work. It came out of it. So, and I actually read this poem when I did the first uh, orientation where I was as a, as a casted figure. And so the poem is uh, white, the non-color reflective constructed collective synthetic skin suit. Refute that same superior status story soft sugar served to our subconscious. It's all nonsense, rice, sugar, flour, it's all processed to disempower. Getting sour cream in the same logic as seen with the satin sheen on gallery and museum walls. Curated divides, white hides, concealed class, considered it unsightly infrastructure. Its surface so superfluously superficial, a strategic semblance that we hang conquer cultural acquisitions, like military medals, prideful, prestigious, which leads us to the shadow side of the story, missing in action. In alleys, graceful graffiti writers tag dingy dumpsters, signing Sumi scrolls in a moment without hesitation and celebration, ceremonial ciphers and hyper-ritualized rhymes reverberate, like amplified acupuncture on asphalt skin, healing blood channels blocked and blocks break dance on broken down boxes of brown, triumphantly, free from bougie lacquered frames, flat perceptions, and plexi perimeters or price tags. Labels get sticky, skin surface clinging, bringing our true depth to death. It's definitely not color. It's how we see color as the other. Sometimes I see people just oblivious to whiteness. Like, why should I fight this male, pale, pigmented privilege that confines and defines our institutions' uniformed insecurity? Sometimes it seems like we're so obsessed with treating art and people like objects to arrest. Who wants to be possessed under the power of a procurer? The best gallery I ever worked for is gray. I'm in search of a neutral space. Art shouldn't be shh and put in its place. It speaks to its place. And space, it echoes back 
conversing with its muse, using its museum that houses figures as its walls, frosted facades, callous cold, old, plastered, and white. Sometimes it could feel uptight in the shell of a skin that were cast in. It's time to crack and hatch and reemerge vulnerable and open up at openings, touring beyond white walls of work, wine, and cheese. Crackers, it's a lavish luxury not to understand our own fabricated pedestals. So high art, fine art, level out your nose, dialogue with the rugged and the low, because overlooked brilliance boils in steaming street scenes. So sweat it out, let it out, reinstate and appreciate art's natural state. Contemplate this, museums need art, but does art need museums? Now damn, that's a fine line that won't rest until these rhymes mingle in minds live at the Guggenheim. <laughs> I want to say that there was like, from the beginning where I was like really just talking about drawing, there was something missing. There was like, there was something missing, um, a really important part of me that I didn't know how to put in my work. Because I didn't know how it would be received, you know? And I was scared. But I also knew that the greatest work that I could create, I would have to challenge myself and challenge others and not be afraid or give a shit what anybody thought. And that was this last work. Um, since then, I've make, been making a lot of collages. And the thing that really came forth to me with, with the collages that I was making was, um, one, there's like all these like amazing simultaneous things happening all around the planet. And, and being able to take things from various different spaces and collapse it into one space was really fascinating to me on that level. But there was also, you know, my love for like hip hop and street art and all of those things. Um, I found a lot of commonalities between different cultural practices, processes, whether it be playing hockey or having graffiti art or some sort of, you know, spiritual. Um, life that, you know, just like when I was drawing and I would, would lose myself, there was, uh, there was a, a certain level of, of transcendence that would take place through any of those actions. So there was various different things that I played with in each collage, but those were some of them, you know, finding relationships between different cultural practices and, 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 and seeing the similarities between them and, and the wholeness, the connection between them. Um, I have tons of these. These are like I got. These are just like a couple, but you know, break dancing and you know, and kung fu and graffiti in the background, and and some of them are more whimsical, you know, and just playful, like the kid on the on the rope swing, or um, you know, and sometimes there's relationships between the natural world and an industrialized world and putting them into the same space, or so there's a lot of different things that happen in, in each one, but this is this was the thing. So I'm an artist that's not bound by any particular medium. Um, whatever calls me, I move to it and, and let it move through me. And some of the artists that, that inspired that path uh, for me in moving out into the direction of public space and, and having a sense of responsibility with the work that I do, um, David Hammonds. David Hammonds did these. I, this, I just put this particular work because it's one of my favorite projects that he did, but he worked a lot in, in, right in his, directly in his community. And he made these like really huge basketball hoops that were decorated with ornate um, African patterns, but all out of like bottle caps and things that he found in the neighborhood. And then he'd erect these huge basketball uh, hoops. I mean, this one is like, it's like three or four, you know, telephone poles put together and they were called higher goals. And I just thought that they were like, these really powerful statements for people directly in the community. And that just like, that called me into a new place with my work. You know, artists that had the courage to get out there and really speak directly with whom they wanted to speak with. Um, another artist, um, Hank Willis Thomas, I mean, his work is really intense, but he uses marketing and 
and then reframes it uh, in, in all sorts of ways. I mean, he has, you know, projects with like Nike symbols and Timberland symbols, but then he'll make relationships between um, that and, and uh, what, what he sees happening in, in his community. Like one of the other ones that I have a famous Hank Willis Thomas piece is, have you ever seen the, the Visa commercials where it's like, priceless. priceless, right? So like it might say something like, you know, pair of Jordans, $250, you know, a, a gold chain, $300, or a, a gun, you know, whatever, $500, and then it'd be like the price of your son's life, priceless, and it's like a picture of a funeral or something, you know, so like he's, He's got these like really intense messages that he uses, but on on a on a lighter note, and uh, but he's but he is an artist that he sees things and he uses a powerful tool uh, such as um, you know marketing to really get his work out into into public space. Uh, Jr. probably one of the most current artists that is really what he's doing is is very profound to me. In his TED talk, he, he, he talked about how he, when he first started, he used to write his name on a wall to tell others that he existed. And then he started taking pictures of other people and posting them on walls to show that other people existed. And now he's empowered like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people to create their own projects and their own communities, like with his ideas and you know his tools, his printing, and um, create projects all over the world. And so, like this, I think was like a village in Kenya that had like the community's faces like on the building, and you know this is like a, ro a rooftop project. But um, he does a lot of you know, public space art that has to do with the people that are directly into the community or the history of the community. And, um, and I think that it's really amazing, like, you know, when I stepped into that space of, like, not performing in my own artwork and having other people step into the experience, like, he's got people all around the planet doing his work, which is also their work. And like that, and that's really like where I'm moving and where, where I'm stepping into that space is to have something that you want to create that aligns with what others want to create and just like have it happen on a massive scale to be able to create some sort of change or uh, shift evolution of consciousness, whatever it may be. You know, of course, you got Banksy, who's definitely like influential in terms of, you know, work that I do. And you know, I, I love like the juxtapositions and things that that he has. And um, and so that's, you know, that's where it ends. But I, I wanna um, I wanted to end with a particular quote that I heard the other day, and it, it was like it was so powerful that it it almost made me cry. It was a uh, Believe it or not, I don't listen to any of Neil Young's music, but I saw a quote by him that was, it was just, it struck me. Maybe I will start listening to him now. It's, um, it says, holding back is so close to stealing. And so for me, as an artist, like being all the way who you are, all the way out there without any reservation, is like offering and sharing to the world. To me, that's my responsibility that I have as an artist and that I encourage you know, others to, to open up that space, to share that space, and to, to be in total acceptance of, of, of who they are and, and, and what, they, what they bring. So um, that concludes like what I have to say. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm curious to know some of the thoughts that, that you may have. I'm here to learn as well as, as share and deepen my understanding of, of what it means to, to be socially responsible with, with my work. Thank you. Thank you.